About 25 years ago, I published uh, several articles, and, and one of them was in uh, the International Review of Law and Economics. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was on the origins of antitrust. And because, and the theme of it was that uh, the Chicago School economists, who were big critics of antitrust regulation, uh, were reformers. Their, their, their take was that, well, yes, for, for the past 100 years, the government has screwed up. It has actually made markets more monopolistic with antitrust regulation than, than what it's supposed to do, is make it more competitive. But if you put smart guys and gals like us, from the University of Chicago in charge of antitrust will change it. Uh, whereas a lot of the Austrians were more uh, like abolitionists. Uh, not all of us, but uh, a lot of us were abolitionists on the antitrust issues because we believed it was inherently incompatible with competition. And the other area, monetary policy, is pretty much the same way. Uh, the Rothbardians uh, have always been in favor of getting rid of the Fed of having uh, you know, a free market in money, not central planning in money. But uh, the famous Milton Friedman uh, you know, became famous for his monetary rule, uh, where he spent much of his career arguing that if you could uh, somehow magically have uh, some omniscient and benevolent bureaucrats who would allow the money supply to grow at only 4% a year, then everything would be peachy with the economy. That's pretty much what Milton Friedman will always be known for uh, forever in terms of economics is his monetary rule. But I th although I think Friedman actually gave up on that late in his life, but that's still what he was known for. But it's still a, a sort of the same idea that, well, if we get smart people like us from Chicago running the Fed, we'll do it better. Uh, whereas the Rothbardians, who Joe is going to talk about uh, in his next in the next talk, uh, were among the abolitionists of uh, of, uh, of central banking and that version of central planning. And so, my my early article that I mentioned on antitrust, I argued that uh, antitrust was rotten from the start. Uh, and I quoted a famous Chicago school uh, law professor. Uh, now a judge, Richard Posner, is calling the, the, the Sherman Antitrust Act the Magna Carta of free enterprise. You know, we had this law in 1890 that uh, without that law, he said, uh, we wouldn't have free enterprise. That's the Magna Carta of free enterprise. And so a lot of Chicago schoolers and others consider the Fed to be sort of the, the Magna Carta of prosperity. And when Doug just explained to us why, if you're a Wall Streeter, well, yeah, it's the Magna Carta of prosperity because of the Cantillon effect. Uh, but so what I'm going to have to say in, in my uh, time here is that uh, I'm going to tell a similar story about the origins of central banking, just like I told the story about the origins of antitrust being uh, an inherently a special interest racket that created protectionism for a, over 100 years now. Uh, the same thing is true of the origins of central banking in America. It always was a corrupt racket, uh, and, uh, and Doug did a very good job just now of explaining some of the types of corruption. And so, uh, so I'm arguing that uh, monetary policy can't be reformed any more than you could reform kudzu. Uh, you know, being in Louisiana, a lot of people in the room probably know what kudzu is. You can't get rid of it. You can't trim it. You can't or have a gardener come in and clip it around the edges and make it look nice. It'll still take over the entire pine forest in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood. You have to pull it out by the roots and then burn the roots is the only, the only possible way of getting rid of this stuff. And that's the same way with the Fed and antitrust as far as I'm concerned. And uh, of course, Murray Rothbard spotted this a long time ago uh, when, when he studied the very beginnings, the very origins of the idea of central banking. And, and think about this, uh, at the very beginning of the American founding, you had people like Alexander Hamilton saying, here's an idea, let's have a bank run by politicians out of the nation's capital. Well, what do you think of that? And, and of course, the Jeffersonians were, were horrified at this because they knew that, that well, that's what the Bank of England was. Uh, and and uh, they just fought a revolution against this kind of crooked system. It was, it was the engine of British mercantilism. But of course, Hamilton and his fellow Federalists, who are also known as the Nationalists, uh, they took the attack that uh, Mel Brooks took in the, in the movie History of the World Part II, where Mel Brooks played the King of France and, and he kept saying over and over again, a laugh line, it's good to be the king. And, uh, and so Hamilton and the nationalists thought, well, it's bad to be on the paying end of a mercantilist empire, but if you're on the, uh, the, the collecting end, it's a, good, it's a good gig to be on the, you know, the, pay, the payee rather than the payer. So they wanted to run the bank. And here's what um, uh, Murray Rothbard said about this in, in his book, The Mystery of Banking. Uh, 
uh, he, he knew that uh, one of the wealthiest men in America at the time was Robert Morris, and, uh, and his, his compatriot, his political compatriot, was Alexander Hamilton. And here's what they were up to at the very beginning of the American Republic. He says, Morris and his compatriots wanted to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. That's Murray Rothbard. And of course, this is all true. This all came into, into being eventually. But at the time, there were some people, like Thomas Jefferson in particular, who said, wait a minute, this sounds like a bad idea. We just fought a revolution against this idea. Uh, Rothbard goes on to say that an important part of the Morris scheme, and those of you who knew Murray Rothbard, you could just hear him saying the words, the Morris scheme, he said, was to organize and head a central bank to provide cheap credit and expanded money for himself and his allies. The Bank of North America, that was the first one, the Bank of North America was deliberately modeled after the Bank of England. And so it was, but it only lasted about a year. Its currency became so unreliable and so uh, suspect that uh, it was privatized after only one year. But this, this political cabal centered in New York and Philadelphia and, and Boston, uh, they never gave up. Uh, I mean, to this day, they pretty much control the financial markets, but their, their political descendants do. Uh, but they never gave up. And so uh, what they did was uh, Morris recruited whom Rothbard called his young disciple, Alexander Hamilton, who, uh, who had no experience or education in finance or economics at all. Uh, he had a lot of experience in something else. I, I, I don't know what you would call it. Kissing up, I think, would be what the word. He was, he, as a very young man, he was George Washington's assistant, uh, for example. And, uh, and if you read the, the big Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Hamilton, you'll read of how he got the job as Treasury Secretary. Robert Morris, the richest man in America, who had uh, was also uh, made a lot of money as a defense contractor. Maybe he's he was probably the founding father of defense contractors. Robert Morris, uh, he got Hamilton the job. Hamilton knew, knew nothing about finance. And uh, and here's what uh, Ron Chernow, the biographer of Hamilton, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography, said happened. He said, uh, at the end of the American Revolution, and at the very end of the war, he says this, quote, Hamilton brushed up on monetary matters, because he knew nothing about monetary matters, and he had Colonel Timothy Pickering send him some primers. David Hume's political discourses, tracts written by the English clergyman and polemicist Richard Price, and his all-purpose crib, Postlewaite's Universal Dictionary of Trade and Commerce. So Hamilton knew nothing about trade and commerce, so he wrote a dictionary. Uh, then he goes on to say, Hamilton sent a marathon letter to Morris that set forth a full-fledged system for shoring up American credit and creating a national bank. And of course, Hamilton knew that this is what Morris wanted. He wanted uh, the Bank of North America was Morris's bank. He wanted a bank run by politicians that would provide cheap credit to him and his business partners. And so here's the kiss up, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, writing a letter. He works for the m most famous and powerful man in America, George Washington, as his assistant during the Revolutionary War. The war is almost over, and Hamilton's wondering, what do I do next? So he writes a letter to the richest man in America uh, with the help of people who actually knew something about uh, finance and says, I think your ideas for the uh, economic policy after the war are perfect, You're right on. And so uh, it's quite the kiss-up letter. And then in Cherno's uh, book, he says that when, when Hamilton, when George Washington learned that Robert Morris was recommending Hamilton to be the first Treasury Secretary, George Washington turned to Alexander Hamilton and said, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about it. But if Robert Morris wants you in the job, I'll put you in the job. So he was essentially Morris's puppet. Uh, and, and not just Morris, but other people. Uh, he was sort of the uh, chairman of Goldman Sachs, you know, of the day. It's sort of that, it's sort of, you know, put, put in as Treasury Secretary. It's a, it, and some things never change, do they? Uh, uh, he, maybe he was a, sort of the, the uh, Corzine of his day, I guess. You know, he was a Goldman Sachs chairman also. Uh, 
And so, so he wrote this big long, it was a 30-page letter he wrote to, uh, to Morris. And so, so Hamilton began championing the creation of an American version of the Bank of England. And, uh, and here's one of the things he wrote, uh, making the case for a bank run by politicians out of the nation's capital. What a, what a great idea. Uh, he says, and I'm quoting Hamilton, Great Britain is indebted for the immense efforts she has been able to make in so many illustrious and successful wars. Now there's a case for a new bank. Uh, he says, because of the existence of the Bank of England, he spoke of what he called, uh, quote, imperial glory. You know, we can have more imperial glory if we have a bank run by politicians. And then he says this, the tendency of a national bank is to increase public and private credit, and the former gives power to the state for the protection of its rights and interests. Power to the state. So the whole purpose of the central bank, of course, was to give power to the state. And of course, Hamilton, uh, 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 he was constantly badgering George Washington as Treasury Secretary saying we need a government of more energy, government of more power. He thought the Constitution uh, was far too weak, uh, far too limited, and he, he devoted the rest of his life to doing everything he could to undermine the Constitution. It was Hamilton who invented the idea of implied powers of the Constitution, for example, in, when he made his case for the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States. That's where this idea came from that clever lawyers like himself could somehow uh, uh, reinterpret the Constitution on their own and, in, and invent new powers. That was his, Hamilton's uh, legacy. And so, so that was the, the uh, purpose of the first, uh, the first bank. Uh, and, and Hamilton did succeed. They brought, they, they, we had the Bank of the United States uh, as the successor of the failed Bank of North America. And it's well known, if anyone ever, ever studied Hamilton, that uh, he was quite the Machiavellian in, poli in uh, politics. Uh, he was very brilliant, very, and he was a workaholic also. And so that's, that can be a great combination. You know, Steve Jobs was brilliant and a workaholic, so was Bill Gates. But if you have somebody who's a brilliant workaholic in politics, that can be very dangerous. And, and Hamilton is known for championing a large public debt for the sake of having a large public debt, because he, his reasoning was that it would be the wealthier people of the country who would own the government bonds, and they would therefore form a permanent lobbying group for, for bigger government and higher taxes forever, because they would want to make sure there was enough money in the treasury to pay off the principal and interest on their debt. And so that was his reason for a big public debt. It wasn't necessarily to finance anything, but just to, to become an engine of governmental growth. And so, and so one of his first gambits in, in trying to, uh, uh, to do this was the Bank of the United States. There was a, one of the editions of the Federalist Papers was edited by Douglas Adair uh, in the foreword. Douglas Adair wrote this about what Hamilton did when, as Treasury Secretary with the help of his, his party. He said this, with devious brilliance, Hamilton set out by a program of class legislation to unite the propertied interests of the Eastern Seaboard into a cohesive administration party. While at the same time, he attempted to make the executive dominant over the Congress by lavish use of the spoils system, handing out goodies to uh, politicians and, and jobs, government jobs. In carrying out this scheme, Hamilton transformed every financial transaction of the Treasury Department into an orgy of speculation and graft in which selected senators, congressmen, and certain of their richer constituents throughout the nation participated. So graft paying off politicians to support his big government agenda is how he ran the Treasury Department. And one of the biggest gambits uh, that, that he, uh, he undertook, uh, he, with the help of his political cronies, was a, a, a really one of the really first big political insider trading schemes where the government agreed to, the government was about to nationalize the debt of the states. And they were to pay off, uh, they were, the government was going to buy up this debt at face value. And at the time, some of these bonds that had been in the pockets of Revolutionary War veterans who were paid partly in bonds and not currency uh, were trading between 2 and 10% of, of value, of, of face value. And so the insiders, members of Congress, uh, the political insiders, people who are uh, closely associated with the Federalist Party, they knew this. They knew the government was going to buy up these bonds at 100% of face value. And so they went on a, a wild spending binge 
uh, going up and down the eastern seaboard, buying up all these bonds from the Revolutionary War veterans and whoever else owned them, because they knew that in the near future they could sell them at 100%, buy them at 2% and sell them at 100%. And here's, there's, a, there's a biography of Hamilton and Jefferson by uh, Claude Bowers. I think the book is called Hamilton and Jefferson. It's a famous old 19, 1920s era biography. And here's how he explained what happened. He says this, quote, imagine this going on. Imagine members of Congress, uh, literally members of Congress, hiring uh, people to drive stagecoaches to North Carolina and, and, and all over the place to buy up these bonds. He says, expresses, which, by which he meant stagecoaches, with very large sums of money loaded with cash, are on their way to North Carolina for purposes of speculation and certificates, splashed and bumped over wretched winter roads, Two fast-selling vessels charter, chartered by a member of Congress who had been an officer in the war were plowing the waters toward uh, southward on a similar mission. And so they went on a mad dash and they bought up all these, uh, these bonds and they made, uh, made a pretty good uh, profit on it. Uh, Robert Morris made at least 18 million in this. Governor George Clinton made 5 million. Hamilton himself bought the bonds. But, uh, 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 quote, through buying agents in Philadelphia and New York. And, uh, and although Cherno in his um, biography of Hamilton claims that, well, yeah, Hamilton participated in this personally, uh, but the money that he made, he gave to his brother-in-law as a gift. He says that. And so when you read some of these biographies, uh, you get a, a lot of good belly laughs out of it. Uh, in the same biography, uh, by the way, uh, Ron Cherno says that, well, yes, Hamilton purchased six slaves at a slave auction once, but they were for his brother-in-law. He must have really loved his brother-in-law as a dear, <laughs> dear beloved relative. He, he bought slaves for him. He gave him millions of dollars. Uh, well, well what, what a lucky man to have a brother-in-law like Alexander Hamilton. And, uh, and so, but it was Thomas Jefferson who smoked out these people. Uh, he understood what was going on. In a February 4th, 1818 essay, uh, this is long after Hamilton died. Hamilton uh, uh, died in 1804 uh, in the famous duel with uh, Aaron Burr. And uh, my old friend Gary North uh, at once uh, started up a Aaron Burr Society. And uh, their, their, logo, their logo was not soon enough. It was the Aaron Burr Society. <laughs> Maybe the Mises Institute will be selling T-shirts with that uh, 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 with the mugshot of uh, Hamilton and not soon enough on there. But here's uh, here's what um, Jefferson is up to. He, he wrote in this letter: Hamilton's financial system had two objects. First, as a puzzle to exclude popular understanding. That is, he made it really confusing sounding, so the average member of Congress even could not understand what the heck he's up to, and. Secondly, as a machine for the corruption of the legislature, end quote. So, so Jefferson observed all of this, the arbitrage, the, the, the patronage jobs, the, the big spoil system that, that, that Hamilton and the Federalists uh, had created to buy the votes of members of Congress to expand government beyond what the Constitution would allow for. Uh, but but they're, they're, they had a problem. The Federalists faced the problem. Uh, and here's, here's the, well, the root of the problem. Jefferson is describing Hamilton's view of government. He says this, uh, Jefferson said that Hamilton avowed that the opinion that man could be governed by one of two motives only, force or self-interest. Force, he observed in this country, was out of the question. And the interest, therefore, of the members of Congress must be laid hold of to keep the legislature in unison with the executive branch. And with grief and shame, it must be acknowledged that this machine was not without effect, that even in this, the birth of our government, some members were found sordid enough to bend their duty to their interests and to look after personal rather than the public good. And he goes on, Jefferson went on to say that men thus enriched by the dexterity of a leader would follow, of course, the chief who was leading them to fortune and thus become the zealous instruments of all his enterprises. So Thomas Jefferson is saying that uh, well, yeah, Jefferson or Hamilton made these people rich with this arbitrage scheme and other, other means, so of course they're going to follow him and vote his way. But the big problem is that this, was, this arbitrage where they, they nationalized the debt was a one-time deal. Uh, and so you know, as soon as these, these men who benefited from it retired or died off, then they would no longer have the votes to, 
to keep this engine running, to keep the engine of big government running. So, uh, so Je Jefferson says this, some engine of influence more permanent must be contrived. Something more permanent, a permanent engine of corruption. And uh, what do you suppose he was referring to? Who would like to take a guess? A, a bank, yeah, his next words are, this engine was the bank of the United States. And so once you establish a bank run by these politicians or influence, heavily influenced by these politicians, that would be a permanent engine of corruption. And so that, that is the purpose that uh, Jefferson said was the purpose of a central bank, a permanent engine of corruption that would fuel the growth of the state by buying off the political support, not just of members of Congress, but also the wealthier people of the, of the country who, uh, who, as Doug mentioned, are always the first, uh, uh, among the first to benefit from monetary expansion. Uh, today, you know, it's the Wall Street crowd uh, primarily. And so, of course, Jefferson famously said that Hamilton was not, quote, not only a monarchist, but for a monarchy bottomed on corruption. And that's very true. You know, at the Constitutional Convention, Hamilton proposed a permanent president, monarchy. Uh, but bottom, but it had to have corruption too. As long as we have a legislature, we had to corrupt the legislature to get our big government agenda in. And then the the final thing I'm going to say about uh, Jefferson here is that uh, he he, um, he also wrote about a, a famous dinner he had, uh, a, a dinner conversation with uh, the Secretary of War Henry Knox, John Adams, President John Adams, and U.S. Attorney General Edmund Randolph and Hamilton. Okay. And so, uh, and Jefferson recalled how John Adams uh, was talking about the British Constitution at this dinner party. And here's what Adams said. He says, purge that Constitution of its corruption and give to its popular branch, that is the legislative branch, equality of representation, and it would be the most perfect Constitution ever devised by the wit of man. And so Hamilton responded to this, and Hamilton said this, purge it of its corruption and give to its popular branch equality of representation, and it would become an impracticable government. As it stands at present, with all its supposed defects, it is the most perfect government which ever existed. So he's praising the corruption. He's saying that the corruption is an a, a important ingredient of the British system. And so, uh, so Jefferson um, uh, concluded from this that he says that Hamilton was so bewitched and perverted by the British example as to be under thorough conviction that corruption was essential to the government of a nation. And, and of course, he was right. Uh, that's, that's, that's exactly what, what Hamilton was up to. And so, uh, and of course, there was a famous debate uh, between Hamilton and Jefferson over the constitutionality of the bank, and we did get the first bank in the United States. And uh, as Rothbard wrote, it, it promptly created 72% price inflation in its first year, first five years, rather, first five years, it, uh, it corrupted politics, it had a 20-year charter, and Congress did not renew the 20-year charter because it created boom and busts, it created price inflation, and it corrupted politics. Just exactly what uh, the Jeffersonians uh, knew uh, central banking had done in England uh, all that time. That's why they were opposed to it. And then, of course, we, it was resurrected after the War of 1812 because it, uh, the, the, the excuse of monetizing the war debt was used to bring back the Bank of the United States. So we got the second Bank of the United States. And it, it went back into business in January of 1817. And then uh, who knows the title of Murray Rothbard's uh, dissertation at Columbia University? What's that? Was the Panic of 1819. Yeah, so the, the, the central bank comes back into being in 1817, and then we have the Panic of 1819, which Rothbard points out it was the first time ever where, you, where we Americans saw large-scale unemployment in the cities. I think he, he said unemployment in Philadelphia went from something like uh, 9,300 people employed to uh, 2,300 people employed, so, something along those lines, pretty big drop in, in, uh, in, in employment. And, and so Andrew Jackson really knew what he was talking about when, uh, if you fast forward to the 1830s, uh, early 1830s, when he vetoed the rechartering of this bank over the same reasons, economic instability, but especially corruption. Uh, and, and so uh, and when Jackson did this in his actual statement, uh, a veto statement, he vetoed the rechartering and Congress was unable to overturn the veto. So the bank, the second bank of the United States uh, eventually went out of business. Uh, he said this, he said, uh, 
He called it subversive of the rights of the states and dangerous to the liberties of the people. He said, every monopoly and all exclusive privileges are granted at the expense of the public and the many millions which this act, that is the rechartering of the Bank of the United States, proposes to bestow on the stockholders of the existing bank must come directly or indirectly out of the earnings of the American people. And so uh, he, had, he was a, a good Jeffersonian on the banking issue. He understood this. And of course, uh, as I said earlier, some things never change, do they? We, uh, these, these forever. For, uh, as soon as the discussion of a central bank started, there was one side that said, it's gonna create, uh, create economic instability, it's gonna corrupt politics. And of course, Jefferson himself was very well educated on the economics of his day. If you were to walk into Monticello tomorrow, Jefferson's home in, in Charlottesville, uh, and, and walk in the front door and you turn around like this, you'll see a, a statue of uh, Turgot, the French finance minister, who was a precursor of the Austrian school. He had read Adam Smith and Ricardo and, and uh, Turgot and, and, and people uh, of that, you know, eventually, you know, by the time he died, he certainly knew the, knew of these of all of these people. Whereas Hamilton uh, uh, didn't. Uh, he, he, I don't. I don't think he ever read the Wealth of Nations, uh, and and uh, he was he read uh, sort of political tracts by British mercantilists who made the case for protectionism and things like that. And uh, and so, and so the people who understood economics and how markets work, they were dead set against the central bank. They were, they were the Jeffersonians. And, and this battle, uh, you know, persists to this day. I guess uh, some of the people in this room are the uh, the political heirs of the uh, the original anti central bank Jeffersonians, whereas uh, the uh, the John Corzines of the day are the political heirs of the Hamiltonian side of the bank because they understood uh, fully well the criticisms and they knew the criticisms were correct that the central bank would be an engine of corruption, and but they said their their take has always been. But it's good to be the king, you know. If you, have, if, you know, after all, when we have corruption, it's because somebody benefits from corruption, and so the people who benefit corruption always want an engine of corruption. Of course, they do, uh, and so there you have all the defenders of the Fed, and then I guess the other category of people who are the defenders of the Fed are the naive and unge uneducated economics professors who get paid by the Fed. Uh, so I think uh, I was our friend Larry White did a study once. Uh, and published in, a, in an academic journal that uh, I think he said 80% of all the economists who write scholarly articles about the Fed are paid somehow by the Fed, you know, either as consultants or a, a research contract or something like that. And so that's a, that's a part of today's engine of corruption. And so the moral of my story is that just as with antitrust, which I wrote about 25 years ago as being inherently incompatible with free market competition, uh, I think the, the whole idea of a central bank was, was always intended to be inherently incompatible with economic stability, but also inherently compatible with, with uh, a permanent uh, regime of uh, corrupt government. And I don't think I have to convince too many people in this room that that is certainly what we have today with, with the Fed and its bailouts and its close, cozy relationship with, uh, with, uh, with Wall Street. And, uh, and I guess our, my time is about up. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for supporting the Mises Institute. We'll all be glad to sign all these books, and uh, you will not be allowed to leave the room until you buy one of my uh, Hamilton books here. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, you all signed on agreement of that when you, when you signed up for the conference. Thank you. <laughs>